Hi, my name is Terry Zwollen, and today I'll be talking about measuring outcomes for patients with cochlear implants. I do have some financial disclosures. I'm a member of the Advisory Board for Cochlear Americas. I'm a consultant trainer for the Institute for Cochlear Implant Training. I'm also an employee of the University of Michigan, as well as a part-time employee of Wayne State University. Importantly, the cochlear implant audiologist and the surgeon monitor performance of this surgically implanted device. This includes regular monitoring of performance, which begins with the preoperative test process. We'll start by talking about the role of preoperative testing. We'll review common testing procedures, and we'll also talk about modifications to test procedures that are performed either pre or post implant. So let's begin with the role of preoperative testing. We all know that the purpose of this is to determine if a patient meets candidacy requirements for a cochlear implant. This helps us determine the expected postoperative outcomes. The audiologist and the surgeon both take a detailed case history in order to find out information about the duration of hearing loss, the cause of hearing loss, use of amplification in both of the ears. The surgeon will perform a medical evaluation, which will often include CT or MRI, which will help tell us about the anatomy of the inner ear. We additionally perform aided and unaided testing, and this all helps us estimate the outcome that we anticipate the patient will receive with the cochlear implant. It's important for us to be aware of factors that could contribute to good performance, as well as those that could contribute to poor outcomes. Reduced performance with a cochlear implant is not expected, especially when we compare to the performance preoperatively with a hearing aid. This could be indicative of several different things, including an implant device failure, non-compliance or, or non-use of the device, poor educational or rehabilitative needs of the child. We need to perform adequate speech recognition testing with the appropriate amplification prior to implantation so that we can help set the level of expected outcome. So in cases of structural abnormalities of the inner ear, that radiographic testing and preoperative objective measures such as electric auditory brainstem response will help us evaluate the stimulatability of the selected ear, which will also give us some prognosis for outcome. If we don't get a response by EABR or there are structural abnormalities, our prognosis for speech recognition may be limited. When cognitive delays are present, the prognosis for speech recognition may also be limited. So let's review some of the common test procedures that we use with implant patients. Speech perception testing has changed greatly over the past several years. In early clinical trials, tests were easier than they are today, but the criteria were stricter as the benefits of implants were not yet known. In early clinical trials, patients were required to demonstrate no benefit from hearing aids as indicated by a score of 0% correct on measures of open set speech recognition. Today, tests are becoming increasingly difficult and criteria are becoming less strict as the benefits of cochlear implants have become clear. If we look at pre versus post-operative measures, uh, we, we see that the batteries are typically very similar. It helps demonstrate improvements in speech recognition following inter intervention as well as over time. These batteries help us determine if modifications to preoperative testing are appropriate, such as testing and noise that we'll talk about in a, little, in a little bit. It often becomes challenging when test materials change over time or when linguistic abilities of the child change over time and we can't use the same test materials. This talk will review some of the measures used with CI recipients to evaluate outcomes. We'll talk a little bit about adults, children, and patients who require modifications to standard test protocols. So let's begin with the very beginning of the test procedure. We should always start with calibration of our test signals as well as a listening check. Speech recognition materials as well as noise materials should always be calibrated, and it's very good to have a sound level meter on hand that you can use for testing in the sound booth. It's always recommended to perform a listening check of the cochlear implant microphone. Special tools, tools are available to do this. Poor microphone quality can have a great impact on performance and can actually disguise themselves as a, a failure of the implant device. We typically begin with sound field detection, which is very essential to evaluate with cochlear implant users. 
There's no real ear verification test available for cochlear implants, so we need to rely on this functional testing or functional gain that's measured in the sound field. For most cochlear implant patients, sound field thresholds typically fall between about 10 and 40 decibels for patients with normal cochlea. Patients with abnormal cochlea may demonstrate elevated thresholds. Elevated thresholds should be questioned. We should look to see if we have elevated thresholds. It could be due to inappropriate programming. And we also need to check to see if the equipment is functioning properly. This is a slide of a typical CI audiogram where the thresholds will fall between about 10 to 25 decibels across the sound field, across the sound range. There are several considerations that we should use when thinking about the test materials we, were we will use. Presentation level can be 70 dB, 60 dB, or even 50 dB. 60 dBA SPL is the most commonly used presentation level today. We can also administer measures via open or closed set. We can present them in quiet versus background noise. And if we do use background noise, that can be multi-talk or babble or speech noise. We can present our information using auditory only, visual only, or auditory plus visual. We can use recorded or live voice. And we need to think about how often we want to administer our, our tests. We recommend three months, six, 12, and annually after that. When working with implant candidates, if they have two implants versus one, that will also affect our test situation. Speech recognition testing should be performed for each individual ear in order to monitor function of the implanted device. We should also monitor performance of the hearing aid in the contralateral ear if the patient is utilizing a hearing aid in that ear. Testing with both ears should also be used to ascertain the bilateral or the bimodal benefit the patient receives from using both devices. When time is constrained, we believe that individual ear testing trumps bilateral testing, again because that lets us monitor the function of each individual ear. The most commonly used speech recognition measure or test battery for adults is the minimum speech test battery. You can access this battery via the URL listed on your screen. The current version of the minimum speech test battery was released in 2011, and that was sponsored by Advanced Bionics, Cochlear Americas, and Medel. Versions are available on CD from the implant manufacturers, and this is currently considered to be the recommended protocol for testing adult patients. The MSTB includes AZ Bio sentences, which include eight lists of 20 sentences, CNC word lists, a standard BKB SYN test, they also recommend sound field calibration of the noise or the tone, as well as a recommended presentation level of 60 dBA. Their protocol recommends one list of AZ Bio sentences presented in quiet, one list of AZ Bio sentences presented in noise, and they recommend either 10 plus 10 or plus 5 dB signal to noise ratio, depending on the skills of the listener. They recommend one list of CNC words, as well as one 16-sentence list pair of BKB SYN sentences. They estimate about seven minutes per test, so it should take about 30 to 45 minutes to administer this test. If your time is short or if you have time constraints, then they recommend if you're gonna cut the battery down to include AZ Bio sentences in quiet, AZ Bio sentences in noise, as well as a list of CNC words in quiet. They provide recommendations for the test setup for both speech and noise presented from the same speaker. If you're going to use a signal to noise ratio of plus five dB, they recommend the speech be administered at 60 dB while the noise be administered at 55 dB. The AZ Bio sentences are very helpful um, and they're great to include in the test battery because they include sentences spoken by multiple male and female talkers using conversational speaking style and rate. There are limited contextual cues and the sentences range in length from very short to actually fairly long. On this slide, you can see some samples of the AZ Bio sentences and how they vary. And what you do is you administer a sentence and you score the number of words correct that the patient was able to repeat back. Here we show some samples of CNC words which is a monosyllabic word test where stimuli are preceded by the prompt ready. So they'll, they'll hear the word ready, goose, 
Ready, shoo. Responses can be scored for phonemes correct as well as percentage of words correct, and you end up with a percent correct score at the end. The BKB SIN sentences are sentences spoken by a male talker in four talk or babble at pre-recorded signal to noise ratios that decrease in 3 dB steps. So you'll start off with a fairly easy signal to noise ratio and as time progresses, then it will become more difficult. At the end, you average the scores from the two tests to, to develop or determine the signal to noise ratio in dB at which the subject understands about 50% of the keywords. So now we'll move on to the pediatric speech perception battery. We often use a hierarchical battery that starts with auditory behavior or functional assessments. We do informal, formal detection or identification of speech sounds. We evaluate closed set identification of speech as well as open set speech recognition. The functional assessments that are used most often are the it maze, the maze, and the little ears. The it maze is used for children from birth to three years, and it's a parental questionnaire that includes 10 questions where we evaluate the child's meaningful use of sound in their everyday situ situations. The maze is used with children typically who are three years of age and older, and again, it includes 10 questions just like the it maze does. The little ears is a little bit longer. It includes 35 parental questions that assess auditory development. We want to look at the child's ability to detect both speech sounds as well as sounds in the sound field. The Ling-6 Ling speech sound test determines the audibility of the speech signal across the auditory spectrum. So what we'll do is typically present these at a natural unforced vocal effort. So this gives us an indication of the sound energy across the long-term average speech spectrum, and we can tell if the child is able to detect these sounds. We can take this from a level of detection to a level of identification as the child progresses through their auditory discrimination skills. Like the adults, we will want to evaluate their detection of sounds in the sound field, and they too should demonstrate detection that falls between 10 and 40 dB for all of the frequencies across the spectrum. There are several closed set measures we can use with children. Closed set measures limit, limit the number of response alternatives to a fairly small set. The chance score will depend on the number of choices that are available in the closed set for the child. The vocabulary of test items really will help determine the age appropriateness of the test and will help us determine which tests we should use with which children. We'll take you from simple to more complex closed set tests, beginning with the early speech perception test, or the ESP, and this assesses pattern perception of one, two, or three syllable words in a four choice closed set format. We can use actual items to evaluate this, or we may use picture cards for the child. When the child is done, we can classify their performance as simple detection, as an ability to identify pattern perception, they might demonstrate some word identification or consistent word identification. The next one we might use is the Northwestern University Perception of Speech, or the New Chips test, which has four possible choices. It's a picture pointing task with, with these four choices, so the chance score would be 25% correct. The next one we'll talk about is the Word Intelligibility by Picture Identification task, or the WIPI. This is also a picture pointing task that provides the child with six possible responses, so the chance rate of score is about 17% correct. If we move on to open set measures, we know that these measures provide an unlimited number of response alternatives. They tend to be more difficult than the closed set test, so their chance score typically falls at about 0% correct. One of the most commonly used open set tests is the multisyllabic lexical neighborhood test, or the MLNT. This is an open set test of word recognition that contains 12 lexically easy and 12 ex lexically hard words that are typically presented via recording, but could also be presented live voice. Typical words used in the MLNT include animal, monkey, the harder words might be measles or naughty. The next test we'll talk about is the Lexical Neighborhood Test, or the LNT. It's an open set test of 25 lexically easy and hard monosyllabic words. So unlike the MLNT, they're monosyllabic words. They are also administered via a recording. Examples of easy words would be juice, good, drive, or time, whereas hard words might be thumb, pie, wet, or fight. 
So now we're going to move on to some sentence level materials for our pediatric patients. There are pediatric AZ bio sentences that are similar to the adult AZ bio sentences. These sentences are available through auditory potential and they can be found online. The lists of AZ bio sentences, there are 16 lists of 20 different sentences. Recently, a group of professionals put together a pediatric minimal speech test battery that is similar to the adult version. It was submitted for publication by Euler et al. And it includes recorded test materials with a recommendation presentation level of 60 dBA. They also recommend assessment of some soft speech at a presentation level of 45 dBA, as well as some assessment of speech and noise. This demonstrates a trend that we're seeing with both our adult and pediatric patients to drop the level to soft speech, as well as to evaluate how well patients hear when we present sentence material in the presence of background noise. Oftentimes, we might need to modify our test procedures if the patient does not have appropriate hearing, does not have appropriate cognition to perform our tasks, if they're difficult to test, or if we want to stress the system to see how the patient does in more difficult listening situations. We may often do that prior to recommending an implant as it will help us with our decision regarding candidacy. Some of the general modifications that we might make with a cochlear implant is that we might need to rely on auditory behavior or questionnaires or functional assessments. If we think about very young babies, we might have an ABR, we might have some aided detection in the sound field, but we can't do formalized speech perception testing. So we might only be able to rely on the auditory behavior questionnaires provided by the parents or the evaluations provided by the speech pathologist to help us with our determination of candidacy or determination of benefit following implant. We may need to simplify the task in order to make testing possible. For some children, we can't separate ourselves through the sound booth and we might need to administer our tests live voice in our office instead of using tape materials. We might need to administer auditory only and compare that to auditory plus visual in order to see that we actually are receiving benefit from the device. We might need to familiarize the child's vocabulary prior to testing him or give, him, give them a few practice items and we may need to modify the materials for non-English speaking patients. We may need to modify the response mode for patients with poor intelligibility because most of these tests rely on the patient to repeat back what they hear. And if we can't understand what they're saying, we're not sure if that's because they haven't heard it correctly or they're not producing it correctly. So in those situations, we may need adult, adult patients where we utilize close set tests where they point uh, and we might need more close set tests with children than we would expect to use. When we're assessing candidacy, we might use more challenging measures to accurately reflect where their difficulty lies. We might present again at a reduced intensity in quiet or use our background noise. With older children, we might want to utilize measures that are more appropriate for their language level. So we might use our adult measures such as CNC words, hint sentences, or AZ bio sentences with our older children. Similarly, with cognitively impaired adults, we might want to administer lower level tests that we might use with younger children in order to assess benefit. If we modify our test procedures, either pre-implant or post-implant, we should include all of the information in the report regarding the test materials and how they were administered. We should indicate why testing was performed the way it was and elaborate on the performance differences we see, for example, when someone's tested in quiet versus when they're tested in noise. In our report, we should indicate whether the patient meets FDA-approved indications. If they don't meet FDA indications, we should state that, and we should contact the insurer to ask for off-label consideration if we feel as though they're still a candidate for a cochlear implant. All of the testing that we've performed will help us justify why we believe this person meets candidacy criteria for a cochlear implant. So now let's review a case example where we've modified our test procedures both preoperatively as well as postoperatively to evaluate performance with the implant. This young lady was born prematurely at 33 weeks, experienced fetal high drops, and was treated with gentamicin. 
She failed her universal newborn hearing screening, and an ABR confirmed a bilateral moderate sensory neural hearing loss. She was fit with hearing aids at the age of three months and attended weekly auditory verbal therapy. When she started to not make progress with sound development over time, she was referred for a cochlear implant based on her noted decline in speech and hearing skills by her speech language pathologist. When we look at her audiometric testing, we find that she does not really qualify for a cochlear implant based on her audiometric findings. Criteria currently state that you need to have a moderate to profound sensory neural hearing loss in both ears. She has more of a severe hearing loss and is really only profound at one test frequency. If we look at her aided benefit, you'll see that she has very good detection skills. They actually look like the same detection skills we would ex expect from a cochlear implant recipient. They're falling at about 20 to 30 dB across the board as demonstrated by the diamonds on this slide. If we look at her preoperative speech and language measures, which has really facilitated the referral for a cochlear implant, the speech language pathologist tested her speech and language measures in 2011, 2012, and 2013. We're seeing the scores at those three different years represented in bars that are blue, green, and black. We see scores on the PPVT or Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, the comprehension subset of the OWLs, and the expressive subset of the OWLs is on the far right side. What the speech pathologist noted, especially with the PPVT and the OWL's comprehension, is a noted decline in her speech and language skills over time. We've seen that 2011, all of her scores were falling within the normal range, which we would expect her to score between somewhere between 85 and 115. The speech pathologist noted this decline, as you can tell by the OWL's comprehension, her expressive uh, wasn't as delayed, but if we waited longer, it probably would have demonstrated greater delays. But her comprehension was really being affected by this increase in her hearing loss. In terms of her speech recognition, we evaluated her using the lexical neighborhood test, and we presented this to each ear, as well as in a binaural test condition. We tested her at 60 dB, which is represented by the blue bars, and we tested her in her right ear aided alone, her left ear aided alone, as well as in a binaural aided condition. What we see is with the right ear aided, which is her better ear, at 60 dB, she's scoring at about 45% on the LNT. Her left ear is borderline candidacy when tested on the LNT at 60 dB, as she's scoring just above criteria at 32%. If we look at her best aided condition, she's doing actually quite well, scoring at about 72%. We decided to drop the intensity level of the LNT to 50 dB. When we did that, the score for the right ear fell to about 20% correct, and the left ear score fell all the way to about 5% correct. Her binaural score with both hearing aids fell to about 28%, bringing her into candidacy criteria for the cochlear implant. We sent a letter to an insurer asking for approval to provide this child with a cochlear implant in her left ear based on these test results. She received a cochlear implant in 2014 and her pre and post implant speech and language scores are described on this slide. We again see the scores for the PPVT, the comprehension subset of the OWLs, as well as the expressive subset of the OWLs. What we're seeing is prior to implant, which the implant is delineated by the red bar that goes through the other bars. We're seeing that we had that decline in these scores. And then one year post implant, we're seeing that she's starting to improve on all three of these measures, bringing her score up to about a standard score of 100, which is exactly where we wanted her to be. And we expect greater improvement over time. If we look at her post-operative speech perception scores, we see that her scores for preoperative are in the blue, her six-month post-implant scores are in the green, and her gray scores represent scores obtained 12 months post-implant. We see scores for the LNT, the MLNT, hint sentences, as well as hint sentences administered with both ears, a hearing aid in one ear and the cochlear implant in the left ear. We see a nice progression of her scores, improvement in that left ear on the LNT. 
Her preoperative score at 60 was 32, and she's already gone up to 42% at six months, but by 12 months, she's almost doubled her score to about 68%. Her MLNT scores are showing nice progression as well, as are her hint sentences. And we're really proud of her hint sentences in a bimodal condition, which are almost approaching 100% correct. So with this child, she's a great example of someone where our traditional measures really were not sensitive enough to help us determine if she was a candidate for a cochlear implant. We modified our test procedures a little bit to drop the level in order to see how she did in a more difficult test situation. Dropping that level showed a dramatic decrease in scores and really solidified our recommendation to provide her with a cochlear implant. So today we've talked about, about a lot of different things about evaluating performance with a cochlear implant. We reviewed how preoperative testing really helps us set the bar for our postoperative performance. It alerts us to any red flags that we might see or anything that might suggest reduced performance with an implant and helps us set our expectations for performance post-implant. We reviewed both adult and pediatric test batteries and we also reviewed some modifications that can be made to traditional test batteries in order to evaluate candidacy or to evaluate post-operative performance with a cochlear implant. I think we see that speech recognition testing is really an essential component of CI management, preoperatively as well as postoperatively. Such testing should be performed annually after a person receives a cochlear implant, as this helps us evaluate device function, it helps us assess the benefits of our intervention, and it really helps us continually evaluate the rehabilitative needs of our patients. I'd like to encourage you to look at your handouts because they contain a lot of references as well as some information regarding websites that you might find beneficial when looking further at materials about speech recognition assessment of patients with cochlear implants. Thank you.